so we're going to start our Zoominar on uh, Japan at the COP26 and uh, Japan's action in climate. Uh, friends, students, colleagues, good afternoon, good morning, konnichiwa for those of you in Japan um, and wherever you may be. I'm Yves Tibergen, Professor of Political Science, Konwakai Chair in Japanese Research and Director of the Center for Japanese Research at UBC. Uh, within the Institute of Asian Research and the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, before we proceed with the event, I would like to first acknowledge that for us, at least in North America, we are meeting here on the 11th anniversary of March 11. So 11 years ago exactly, Japan was struck by one of the most powerful earthquakes on record causing a massive tsunami that has devastated the Tohoku region uh, and resulted in almost 20,000 deaths in the region. So I would like to start uh, by taking a moment of silence, uh, mokuto, in remembrance of all those affected by the disaster. Thank you. Um, the effects of this disaster reverberate in Japanese society to this day with great effect on energy policy in the country. So we will get back to it. Um, so this is the second event of our three-part climate event series and that we titled Negotiating at the Brink, How Does the World Solve the Climate Crisis? co-organized by the Komakai Chair in Japanese Research at UBC and the Undergraduate International Relations Student Association at UBC. Today, we're specifically looking at Japan's status during the COP26, uh, discussing how the country's environmental, climate, and energy policy will be shaped in the future. So we have a great lineup of panelists for today, but before going further, I would like to take a moment as well to acknowledge the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil people, as well as, as the Hosanich people, uh, who have called this area home for many thousands of years, and we continue to do so today. Uh, we acknowledge that we are meeting on their ancestral, unceded territories. I would like to give special thanks to uh, the organizers of this event, uh, including Fuma Aoki, who will be co-moderating with me and who is here um, as research assistant, as well as Christina Song, who is research assistant at the CGR. Um, I would like to thank the URSA team, particularly Jackie Palayo, Zora Kalili, Patricia Gonzalez, and the CGR assistants, Shiori Uchida, and Komaka Chair Ares Pantea, and Harry. I also thank Michelle and Lindsay March at IRNSPPTA. So this is part of the Konwakai Chair series on questions of disruptions in the global order with special attention to Japan's and Canada's role in global developments in a comparative framework. We are focusing this year on climate change, digital and AI governance, peace and conflict management, and Indo-Pacific strategies. Today, uh, with the event titled Global Leadership or Status Quo Proponent, question mark, Japan at the COP26, we're looking at how Japan has played a leading role in climate change policy in the past. But after making some bold commitments toward carbon neutrality by 2050, Japan appeared to play a more defensive role at the COP26, or at least that's what emerged from outside. So we're going to know more today. We also want to discuss what are the key drivers behind climate innovation, as well as energy status quo in Japan, and Japan's critical role in addressing the global climate emergency that we know is upon us. We have a decade basically to cut by half global emissions if we want to stay within a possible 1.5 degree track. Uh, a couple logistical announcements. Uh, the chat function is disabled, so we're going to use the Q&A window for Q&A, so you can enter questions at any point. Um, this is a recorded webinar, and we will make it available on our CJR website. You're not required to use your camera or microphone to ask questions. You can write questions in the Q&A box, 
and uh, we will be watching them and uh, and uh, saying them for you. Uh, both Fuma and me, we will monitor uh, the box. We will, of course, use uh, your first name only, but only if you uh, if you put your name. Um, so now it's a great joy to introduce to you one of the dream panels on this question, one of the best lineups we can imagine. Um, and I'm going to introduce them. Uh, and they're going to, after that, they're going to go through their presentations. So first of all, we have Dr. Hiroshi Ota, an old friend of mine who is professor at the School of International Liberal Studies at Wasta University researching global international relations and global environmental politics and policy, as well as Japanese foreign policy. It's one of the uh, experts in Japan on both climate change and ocean governance. Um, second to speak will be uh, Dr. Masako Konishi, Deputy Director of Conservation at, at WWF Worldwide Fund, Japan, where she has, for whom she has been attending all COP events since 2006, 2005, sorry. So that's 16 COPs, uh, a, a true veteran of COP meetings, analyzing climate change negotiations and climate policy proposals. So it's really wonderful to have uh, uh, Konishi san with us today. Um, third, we will have Dr. Kameyama Yasuko san, who is a social system division director at the National Institute for Environmental Studies in Japan researching policies toward the creation of decarbonized and sustainable society. Wonderful expertise and thank you, uh, Dr. Kameyama. We, uh, Dr. Kameyama recently uh, wrote a piece that was quite influential in East Asia Forum on those questions of climate uh, in Japan. And then finally, last but not least, we will have Dr. Luenin Hu, who is professor at the Crawford School of Public Policy at ANU in uh, Australia. And he's an expert on low carbon energy transition and climate governance through a global supply chain perspective with a particular expertise on Japan. One of the uh, great experts worldwide in Australia on Japanese climate and energy policy. Uh, so with this, uh, we're gonna jump in and we're gonna turn uh, first to Dr. Hiroshi Ota for his presentation. Thank you, uh, Yves very kind introduction to me. And thank you for also inviting me to this interesting webinar. So I'm going to share the slide first. Let me prepare for that. So first I'm going to provide the overall context on, on, on today's uh, 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 talk. So first I'm going to uh, address the question, why did Japan decide to jump on the bandwagon and how serious is it? Focusing on the uh, 2050 net carbon neutrality. And Japan was uh, rather rugged and for the, during the Paris conference, climate conference, and Japan's mid and long-term uh, green, greenhouse uh, gas emission reduction target was just 26% and from the 2013 level by 2030 and 80% by 2050, quite the behind the Europeans target. So why is that? I think Japan is not necessarily uh, encouraging to promote the renewable energies. This is the uh, en electricity mix uh, before a nuclear accident and after, and an official target uh, 2030. So as of 2010, a nuclear 29%, renewable was just 10%, and 29 liquefied natural gas, and 25 coal, and 7% oil. And then as of 2014, there's no nuclear power plant under operations, and renewables 12% less, close to 90% was fossil fuel. As for the uh, official target 2030s, nuclear is still large, 20, 22%, renewable just slightly larger than nuclear, 20, 24% less fossil fuel. Why Japan has not you know, encouraged the energy transition and ambitious climate change, there's certainly there's a context. <clears throat> so the dominant techno institutional context, consisting of energy, manufacture, and transport industries fell by fossil fuel. But this is not peculiar to Japanese you know, system. All the OECD countries and emerging economies are, also have the same kind of uh, complex. So this complex system evolved through 
positive feedback processes. For example, the internal combustion engine and subsequent development of transportation means, including automobiles, co-evolved with private and public uh, infrastructures, such as roads and gas stations, facilitated by relevant uh, public policies. So techno-institutional lock-in hinders the emergence of alternative technological solutions. Further, uh, positive feedbacks in, for, in the form of past dependence and to lock in situation that creates a very difficult situation to reverse. So SP Moe, who has been studying uh, Japan's renewable energy policies, argued that vested interests of existing economic structure resist structural economic change driven by new industries, including the renewable energy sector. So we can see the demonstrable reality for Japan is a form of carbon locking where powerful vested interests oppose ambitious climate change and energy transition policy that fall short of reflecting their priorities. A little bit more details, a vested interest group opposed, opposing deep and rapid climate change policy and energy transition form uh, policy coalitions consisting of concerned bureaucracies, the ruling party politicians, energy intensive industries, and labor unions. Particularly, K. London directly influences the policy making processes of METI, Ministry of Economic Trade and Industries, and UNRU, uh, Agency for Natural Resources, Energy, as an essential policy council member. For example, K. London, as late as 2019, opposed to carbon pricing, such as a carbon tax and carbon cap and trade system to reduce CO2 emissions. So above all, uh, power companies, energy intensive industries, such as steel, cement industries, petrochemical industries, power plants manufacturers seek to direct governmental climate change and energy policy making, while established conservative positions of ruling party generally support METI and k landing position. So uh, having this context, how come Japan could ratchet up national determining contributions to 46%, 50% aspirational uh, goal and by 2030s, and then also declaring net carbon neutrality by 2050? Uh, certainly there's a top-down decision-making processes, but still we have to ask why Japanese Prime Minister Yoshihide Suga who is a most unlikely uh, political leader to promote decarbonization of Japan. Yet he uh, declared the uh, uh, 2050 net carbon neutralities in October 2020. So how we, we need to explain how come. One of the normal approaches to look at the Gaiatsu for international pressure to explain Suga's decisions. So there are certainly intangible international pressures a state's reputation at stake as environmental energy or resort to the so-called name and shame tactics. For example, the Japanese government frequently received a dishonorable uh, the, uh, fossil award at the United Nations Climate Conference. In tarnished diplomatic reputation certainly does matter. Uh, Japan's uh, national retirement contribution in this is lag behind others. So that this is international pressure may be helped the, uh, uh, the advocacy coalition within Japan, consisting of Minister of Environment, Energy Environment, and, and Environmental NGOs, and economic eco industries to pressure sugar administration. But there are also a tangible, more tangible international pressure like a, a divestment movement. Particularly, global financial investors have increasingly divested from fossil fuel related industries, and the international coal market divestment has occurred in, even in Japanese industries, including general trading companies. And most of the Japanese uh, companies have become members of the United Nations Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosure, TCFD. The you know, 100% coalition companies or coalition also influences Japanese uh, co uh, companies' behavior. But within uh, ruling parties, there certainly there's a trend of, for toward decarbonization. For example, one item of LDP Comitato Policy Agreement in September 2020 is to accelerate climate change policies. Comitato particularly insisted on aiming at net zero GHG emission by 2050. 
there are certainly uh, a policy blockers, like a uh, Kono Taro, who is a champion of renewable energies, and also uh, Shinjiro Koizumi, environmental minister, uh, pressure Suga to take an action. But there are certainly uh, there's few reports on about uh, Hiromichi Mizuno, uh, special advisor to Miti, Meti, co-chair of One Planet Working Group, focusing on the implementation of TCFD recommendations. He suggested to Suga that the uh, drivers of economic growth in the post COVID-19 would be digital transformation and sustainable transformations. And he also suggested if Japan declared that 2050 net carbon neutrality, the international community would appreciate more than China's 2060 net carbon neutrality in September 2020. As a matter of fact, one day after Suga declared 2050 net carbon neutrality, United Nations Secretary General Guterres phoned him congratulating him and also encouraged to pursue this policy further. But even within METI, uh, they began to talk about decarbonization of Japan. For example, uh, strategic energy plan of 2018 mentioned phasing out of inefficient uh, coal power plants and also mainstreaming renewable and the challenge toward decarbonization by 2050s. And following year, 2019, uh, many policy paper also mentioned carbon neutrality 2050. So before Suga's declarations, it was almost as an established policy direction. On top of all these, uh, there's further international development. In September 2020, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen declared to reduce GHG emissions by at least 55% by 20. 30, launching European Green Deal. Similarly, uh, California Governor Newsom uh, issued an executive order requiring sales of all new passenger vehicles to be zero emission by 2035. And then global competition over the electrification mobilities, energy transitions, and technological breakthrough has become intense. And even Japanese companies moved. For example, March 2020, Mitsubishi Shoji and then Chubu Electric Power Corporation acquired the largest Dutch power companies, Eneco, whose strength is wind power and digital technology. So these are the uh, METI's green growth strategy on carbon in 2050. I'm not going into detail because uh, some other speakers talk about this in details. Another push was the uh, President Biden's leader summit on climate. So Japan, uh, Suga administration uh, declared 46% target and aspirational target 50%. Uh, these are the roadmap for the 2015 carbon neutralities. And then 14 uh, industries field, energy related, transportation, manufacturing related, household and office related. But there's a certain challenge ahead. So nuclear and thermal power plants with CCS, CCSU, 30 to 40% by 2050s are too ambitious. And then many uh, uh, expert and environment NGOs said 50 to 6% for Europe are too small. And the steel industries, which emit 40% of Japan total CO2 emissions, face tremendous difficulties. For example, hydrogen for the blast furnace is too expensive, and the electricity furnace require a large amount of electricity. Automobile industry emit 15% of Japan total. Uh, having still uh, quite a long distance to achieve EVs, only 1% uh, for the total fleets. And then there's not enough uh, provision for the infrastructure for EVs, and then also fuel cell vehicles. And then Japan needs further develop the fuel for airplanes and ships. So in, in concluding my presentation, what the take, uh, takes away in recent development in Japan climate and energy policies? The revision to act on promotion from global warming countermeasures. Suddenly, this is a very tremendous improvement in 2050 net carbon neutrality on the books. And the promotion of renewables in local communities is also having a, a great promise in the future. But this is questionable carbon pricing, uh, still MOE, METI are uh, deliberating separately. But one of the main message from my uh, you know, takeaway message is, is a renewable energy lock-in setting in 
by overshadowing the incumbent. So how influential is the advocacy coalition environment NGO, MOE, politician, eco-business industries in Japan to challenge the incumbent? Thank you for your attention. I'm going to end this my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Hiroshi-san, for uh, amazing coverage of the amount of change that has happened uh, and the gradual dimensions of that change uh, in the recent years. So that's a very, very good background setter. And so now I'm going to turn to uh, Konishi Masako-san for, uh, for the story uh, leading to the COP26 and what Japan has done. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Yves-san, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit of the background of why Japan behaved like that at COP26, and then go on to the COP26 story itself. So let me show you my screen. I hope you are seeing it. And now just a little bit background is trend of GHG emissions in Japan and it, its implication. As you see, Japan has committed to the Kyoto Protocol, but since 1990, Japan's GHG emission didn't decline due to the coal power plants expansion. So CO2 emission here, as you see from 1990 to this final, uh, 2007, this core relates to the uh, amount of coal power plants in place. So this one is like this, and then there was a financial crisis and a Fukushima nuclear accident. So the emission again rose. But fortunately, after this 2011, the feed-in tariff was put in place and rapidly renewable energy started to increase in Japan. So as you can see here, the past trend of the Japanese CO2 emissions is dominated by external factors in the absence of climate change policies. So as Dr. Ota has explained, now the energy plan for 2030 in Japan is renewable energy, it's 36 to 38%, but still try to maintain nuclear power plants 20 to 22% which is currently around three to 6%. So it's very unrealistic, but the political debate is not going on because nuclear is a very touchy topic in Japan. And also Japan still try to maintain coal power plants by 19%, which is one of the reason why Japan couldn't get a good reputation at COP26. So as you can see here, Japan has already decided to stop exporting new coal power plants and reduce inefficient coal power plants. But on the contrary, Japan still try to maintain efficient coal power plants, what they call efficient coal power plants. So still eight new power plants in pipeline. In total, 181 coal power plants are still operating in Japan. So COP26. As we all know, at COP26, they have decided to phase down coal power plants, uh, which is very, very unlike, you know, it's, I've been attending COP since 2005, meaning that I have attended 16 COPs, but for the first time in COP decision, this one single energy is mentioned in COP decision, which is very, very unusual. So that means that there is a really world consensus around coal, uh, coal power plants, which is one of the main reasons for accelerating climate change. So the world, to, uh, the attention to coal power plants is really, really high, but in the midst of this attention to the coal power plants, Prime Minister Kishida made a speech at COP26. Japan, um, for the first time, set carbon neutrality by 2050, and it also raised its 2030 reduction target to 46%, which is a very good sign of Japan is moving ahead. But still, Kishida said at COP26 that since solar power plays a major role in the transition to renewables in Asia, to help stabilize electricity frequency in the region, 
converting existing thermal power generation into zero emission power generation is a necessary path. So Japan would uh, set an uh, initiative in order to transform fossil fuel fired thermal power plants into zero emission thermal power, such as ammonia and hydrogen. So Japan basically said, we will maintain coal power plants, but we will try to use ammonia and hydrogen as zero emission power. How does it, this speech was perceived by the civil society is here. So Climate Action Network, which comprises 600 climate NGOs around the world, uh, gave Japan again the fossil of the day award at COP26. And the reason why is that using ammonia and hydrogen as zero emission thermal power, but these novice and costly technology are linked to fossil fuel extraction and would leave little chance of meeting the global 1.5 degrees targets. Meaning that ammonia, hydrogen, if it's in place right now, it may be good, but it's still very novice technology, which is not uh, yet commercialized. And they still plan to use it only 20% by 2034, putting coal power plants, meaning that it's not in line with 1.5 degrees. And of course, not even with two degrees. So what is the purpose of the Japanese government is being questioned here at COP26. So, and again, one other question is, there is no carbon pricing yet in Japan, which Dr. Ota rightly explained um, due to the fierce resistance of the industry association. So yet climate effective policy, such as carbon pricing and coal phase out plan is not in place in Japan. Thank you very much. I will stop my presentation here and wanna listen to that discussion. Look forward to that discussion for the more. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Konishi. This is fascinating and very interesting inside uh, description of what happened and, uh, and the reaction to it. Uh, so now I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. Kameyama Yasuko-san for the next part of the story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody, uh, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Yasuko Kameyama. I work for National Institute for Environmental Studies. This is a, a government uh, funded research institute under the Minister of the Environment. And uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to this important seminar. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, I have prepared a slide to explain the latest developments of climate change policy in Japan. So some of my uh, early slides uh, repeats what has been explained by the two previous speakers, so I'll just skip them. And I'm going to start from this slide. Um, that Japan's decarbonization uh, policy making has been driven mainly by the business sector. And uh, um, I would like to emphasize that trying, uh, the fact that trying to Japan is trying to catch up with other countries that have pledged net zero earlier than Japan. Industry sector that are not energy intensive, such as financial sectors, taking the lead in it. So um, all the debates inside Japan as to how to decarbonize or how to reach the, the emission reduction targets, uh, which are being decided by the Japanese government, uh, has been mainly driven uh, um, te technologically oriented um, discussion. So um, what is missing 
it's a voice from citizens. So I want to focus my talk on, on this part of, of, of my um, presentation file. Um, actually, we are experiencing lots of extreme weather events and uh, many people in Japan feel that the climate is changing. And uh, um, opinion, we, I have looked around all different kinds of opinion polls and they suggest that Japanese people basically acknowledge urgency of climate change. Um, they basically um, uh, agree that uh, climate change is due to um, human induced actions. But however, um, when the opinion polls moves to the next question, are you willing to act? Then um, the people begin to say, well, um, I think one of the reasons why the Japanese people does not wish to act so much is that may, many people believe Japan is still the front runner is in energy saving. And uh, large emitters such as the United States and China are the ones to start moving or the ones to blame uh, as a call uh, uh, the countries causing climate change. And also in Japan, school strikes and climate marches are not popular. Um, there has been some uh, climate marches in Japan as been showing this picture, but we only get um, like one or 200 at, at the most. So um, there has been very little movement organized by the citizens and they don't get the chance to attract uh, most of the, the, the people in, in Japan. And uh, very interestingly, opinion polls suggest that Generation Z, Z in Japan, so the young people, teenagers or people in the 20s, are less interested in climate change than the older generation. And this trend is uh, totally opposite to uh, what has been shown in uh, opinion polls in other countries. And I've um, found a very interesting opinion poll uh, organized by BBC last October, just before COP26 was organized. And uh, BBC asked people in um, 32 different countries, I, I think. And uh, the, the first question was that, which of the following do you think should be uh, the, the respondent's country strategy at this meeting? Be, uh, this question has been uh, asked just before COP26. And uh, the blue shows play a leadership role in setting ambitious targets to address climate change as quickly as possible. Yellow, take a more moderate approach and support only gradual action to address climate change. Um, red, do not agree to any international agreement that addresses climate change. And you see Japan here, um, it's a fifth um, country from the bottom. And um, uh, I, we can see that um, more people in Japan are um, uh, willing their country, I mean Japan, to take only a moderate approach to support uh, climate change. And this is le much less than the, the, the American people, uh, surprisingly. And the, the next question is, um, how much do you hold each of the following responsible to address climate change government? And here you see Japan at the very bottom of all the countries being asked. And uh, uh, blue is a great deal, yellow some, and red is a little. And uh, uh, more Japanese people are uh, feel, um, I mean, doesn't feel the need for the Japanese government to take responsible to address climate change. And they've uh, had, um, answered very similarly to the next question, um, how much do you hold each of the following responsible to address climate change? People like you and uh, about half of the people. 
uh, in Japan doesn't feel themselves to be responsible to address climate change. So um, looking through all these opinion polls, I, I feel very worrisome that although the Japanese government has committed to the net zero commitment by the 2050, it is very much um, technology driven or business oriented. And uh, um, I, I feel the real need to, uh, as a researcher, to um, approach the ordinary people in Japan and uh, try to um, activate the people in terms of how they should be thinking about climate change. So um, I will stop here and uh, I look forward to the discussion in the latter half. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kamiyama. That that was fascinating and it's pretty uh, <laughs> pretty shocking. It, those numbers look lower than during the ratification debate of Kyoto Protocol in 2005. So uh, something really happened, right? And of course, lower than during uh, Prime Minister Khan's uh, time when there were those huge protests against nuclear, but in general for renewables, right? So something seems to have turn the wrong way. Uh, well, we're going to get back to this in discussion, but for now, I'm going to turn to Dr. Louis Lin Hugh, uh, joining us from uh, Canberra, I suppose. Thanks, uh, Yves, and hi to everybody. Uh, it's terrific to be here, um, calling in from Australia, so a couple of hours ahead uh, of Tokyo time. Let me begin, um, as is customary in Australia, as indeed in Canada, I believe, um, to pay my respects to the uh, the uh, First Nations peoples on lands for, I'm speaking to you from, that is the Wurundjeri people, and also um, uh, pay my respects to elders past and uh, emerging. Uh, so I'm going to uh, talk uh, about uh, very briefly about two different issues, um, and uh, the first of those is, uh, you know, to to show you that something really big happened in uh, 20, uh, 2020 2021. Uh, Japan adopted a new model of uh, uh, decarbonization related decision making based on the idea of backcasting, which is commonly used in Europe and elsewhere. The second point I'm going to make uh, is that um, is that Japan's having problems implementing that. Uh, and the reason for that is because decarbonization is essentially about uh, sectoral uh, creating and uh, meeting sectoral targets. And, um, and there are real problems in the way that Japan's going about uh, setting those targets and trying to achieve them. And the example I'm going to use is ammonia and uh, the use of ammonia within thermal coal, because the way that Japan's going about this is pretty problematic if you think about it in terms of a um, global uh, decarbonization scenarios. So let me just uh, briefly uh, share, my, uh, share my screen. Um, so the first point to make, I guess, uh, as, as I mentioned, is that something quite big happened uh, with Japan um, in 2020-21. And that was uh, a shift to uh, this idea of backcasting. How do we know that something significant happened that we haven't seen before, really? Well, we can look at some of the documents. So Japan's NDC, or Nationally Determined Contribution, uh, at the most recent COP meeting, as others have alluded to, came up with a pretty ambitious statement. This is now built into Japan's international commitments under the, uh, under the Conference of the Parties. Uh, it commits Japan to aiming to cut greenhouse gas emissions by 46% by 2030 relative to fiscal year 2013 emissions, looking for 50% and also setting a mid-century carbon economy-wide goal of carbon neutrality. That uh, was a significant uh, jump from what we had seen before. In fact, the thing that's most interesting about this, or one of the things that's interesting about it, is that in 2020, uh, you know, as is required of governments under the Paris Agreement, uh, you know, required to put in updates, Japan submitted an update to its NDC in 2020, and that NDC uh, repeated Japan's 2015 commitment to a 26% uh, reduction by uh, fiscal year 2030 compared to 2013. So between 2020 and 2021, uh, there was a sea change in the way that Japan has thought about uh, decarbonization um, uh, just in that single year. 
Uh, what was that? Well, it, uh, you know, in a nutshell, it was the Sugar Administration. Um, the Sugar Administration, uh, in, in actually uh, former Prime Minister Sugar's uh, first speech to the Diet, um, he used that speech to essentially commit uh, his government to an economy-wide greenhouse gas net zero uh, emissions target. And then uh, early in 2021, so about a year ago now, um, a further commitment was made uh, as described to a 40%, uh, 46% uh, emissions reduction target by 2030, just uh, eight years away. So there is a very significant uh, change um, which occurred within that particular period. And the question that we've now got is how to meet that. Now, I think that there's good evidence that that, uh, that, that happened in, uh, in, in a kind of top-down decision-making structure. We often talk about Japanese decision-making generally as being bottom-up and technocratic uh, in nature, um, but that's clearly not what did not happen here. Um, the Japanese government under the Basic Energy Act of 2001 is required to uh, review, uh, the cabinet, I should say, is required to review Japan's midterm energy policy settings every three years. And uh, but in uh, 2020, 2021, the Japanese government was going through that process. Uh, it had just kicked it off through essentially the committee within uh, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry responsible for that task. That is the subcommittee on basic energy policy. So this is where uh, the engine room where um, you know the basic energy settings get put together and you can see on the 13th of October uh, of 2020 the uh, first meeting of that subcommittee stated uh, the uh, NDC related targets uh, that the Japanese government put in in, in 2020 that is um, to achieve net zero by the second half of the century. In the meeting that followed that on the 17th of November the language had been changed and it had changed to uh, achieving net zero by 2050. So we saw a vastly increased level of ambition uh, built into the process uh, putting together the basic energy strategy within uh, about five weeks. And, uh, you know, this is strongly suggested that this was not something which bubbled up from, uh, you know, demand supply planning within the ministry, but what was rather pushed in from above and you know there's uh, someone's going to write an article one day um, which will go and chat with um, uh, the uh, various ministers and um, and tell us how that came about so where we are now is that we uh, you know we've got to come up with um, you know, the the uh, you know how to go about achieving that right it's an extremely ambitious target given where Japan stands Here's Japan's uh, primary energy supply. So this includes the transport sector, for example, not just electricity in 2019. And you can see that, um, you know, oil dominates essentially that's transport, some petrochemicals, natural gas uh, and coal, um, coal primarily used uh, in the uh, power sector, um, but also um, a little bit of it for steel making as well, which we can talk about if people are interested. Now, just like every other economy, um, Japan has to follow a particular path. If you look at models uh, leading Japan to get to um, net zero by mid-century, the basic answer to that problem is um, to decarbonize your electricity supply as quickly as you can, and then to decarbonize as much as you possibly can. So we've kind of got this two-phased approach, push lots of renewables into the system, um, and, uh, and, and deal with all the transmission issues you've got to deal with, um, and then, uh, and then uh, electrify as much as you can. So get gas out of heating, for example. So that's the kind of pathway that Japan needs to walk along. Now, in terms of electricity, something very interesting happened in the basic energy plan that we've just seen released. Um, and that is that uh, hydrogen and ammonia was introduced for the first time ever into Japan's electricity generation targets. Now, electricity, we need to decarbonize electricity fast, okay? So um, you can see here that it's a small number, but uh, we've got a 2030 target of 1% of generated electricity coming from ammonia. Essentially, what this represents is the co-combustion of ammonia within Japan's existing thermal coal fleet. We have demonstration projects at scale which show that 20% co-combustion of ammonia is possible within the existing um, coal fleet. Um, and so that should mean that uh, you will get an emissions gain uh, equivalent to the uh, a reduction in emissions equivalent to the 20% cut in the coal which you've used within those within those coal plants. So that's kind of the direction that we are that we are going in. As a couple of the other speakers have alluded to, 
there's a problem uh, in the way that this is happening related to carbon leakage. Um, and that is um, the ammonia, although when it's combusted within Japan is going to be emissions free, the amount of emissions which are uh, created in producing ammonia varies a lot depending on how the ammonia is produced. So we've done some analysis, uh, for example, of an Australia-Japan supply chain um, in which Australia would provide the ammonia uh, for co-combusting uh, the equivalent of 20% of Japan's current uh, coal fleet using ammonia. Uh, sorry, 20% of the fuel load for Japan's coal fleet uh, through ammonia. On the right-hand side here, you can see the emissions uh, related to that, about 40 million tonnes uh, of um, CO2 emissions from a 20% of the fuel load in Japan's current coal fleet. If you look at the, the blue bars here, they show you the emissions from producing ammonia, depending on how that ammonia is produced. And what they show you is um, uh, steam methane reforming with Haber-Bosch, which is the business as usual process using uh, natural gas essentially, leads to zero emissions gain within the error bars from uh, you know, continuing to burn coal. That is, if we keep using uh, you know, steam methane reforming in Haber-Bosch uh, to produce ammonia and then burn that in Japan on a global emissions basis, there's actually no benefit. If you look at CCS, which is what the government uh, is talking about, at 60% and theoretical 90% capture rates, there's still a lot of uh, emissions being produced. At CCS with 60% capture rates, for example, there's somewhere in the region of 25 to 30 million tons of emissions being produced from uh, the, the, um, the production of that ammonia. Now, just to finish, um, JERA, which is the largest coal uh, generator in Japan, it's a joint venture um, between Chuba and Tokyo Electric, um, a couple of weeks ago uh, released a, a request for proposals to buy 50, uh, 500,000 tons of ammonia per year from 2027 through to 2040. And they're gonna use this to burn in their coal plants and do some other things with it too, probably fertilize or whatever. But if you look at the RFP that JERA have put together, um, it said that they will only take clean ammonia and they define clean ammonia as um, no CO2 generated during production or that it is captured and stored. Uh, what that means if we go back is that this um, large amount of ammonia that Jera, Japan's largest uh, coal uh, user in Japan in the power sector is looking at doing is using ammonia which is likely to have CCS in it, if it's, which is likely to be the case 60% uh, CCS, then you've got a really large amount of emissions being produced from that. Essentially, there's a transfer of emission to the international producers of ammonia rather than a 100% reduction of uh, emissions within Japan as a result of ammonia co-combustion. So a lot of problems that we're gonna to have to deal with as we think about implementing these more ambitious targets. Went a bit quickly, hopefully that was useful. Look forward to discussion. Thanks, Eve. Thank you, uh, Dr. Liu and Lin-Hu. So that, that was uh, fascinating. Uh, and uh, pointing out to something that we start to hear a lot, uh, the ammonia story. Um, and so, yeah, with the four presentation, we have a, a good picture uh, from different perspectives here about this kind of tug of war, this uh, combination of high ambition and, uh, you know, and enduring practices that are, you know, still very sticky within the Japanese climate energy space. So maybe I invite now all of you to bring your camera back. I'm going to ask just one question um, to you. you. Maybe if you can take one or two minutes for that first question, and then I'll turn to Fuma for second uh, batch of question, and Fuma will moderate uh, the Q&A from the audience as well. Um, so I wanted to push a bit more the politics behind, and for each, you, each of you, it may take a slightly a different form. Um, so for example, for uh, Kamiyama-san, uh, it's, it's really striking the decrease over time, right, of, of that mobilization of public opinion and, um, and civil society. So I remember when Koizumi hesitated to ratify the, the Kyoto Protocol after the US pulled out, there were pictures in the media of the NGO leaders beating him personally. Uh, there was, uh, 
you know, there was a public community in general that wanted to ratify. It was sort of 60% for, so th there was push coming from civil society and public opinion uh, toward action. Uh, and if anything, we have seen an increase in weather events in Japan as in the rest of the world, right? Terrible heat in Tokyo and terrible flooding and worse typhoon. So it's not like they, you know, Japan can ignore that. Um, and so to get to a point where there's a divergence between public opinion in Japan and, you know, in most of the rest of the world, uh, except for Russia, Singapore, and Hong Kong, I saw the data, it's uh, pretty striking, right? So what's happening here in terms of society and public opinion? Maybe I'll start with that question and I'll have one political question for each of you. Uh, so I'll start uh, with you, Kamiya. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. I think uh, important question. A similar question was also raised in the Q&A box and I've already written a little bit uh, uh, from my own personal view. Um, I think there are several reasons behind it, but I think one of the, the reasons why Japanese people are less interested is that um, for a long time, like more than 20 years, Japan has repeatedly emphasized that Japan is technologically the one of the most energy efficient um, country in the world. Uh, whether or not that sentence statement is true or not, um, I think the Japanese people's mindset has been uh, really fixed in, in that mindset, like um, Japanese people is the most energy saving. And so even though Japanese people are aware of climate change and urgency of climate change, um, many Japanese people feel that we are already doing enough and it's the other countries uh, who must be doing more. So, so I, I'll stop. Mm. Interesting. Maybe next in that political search for who is driving what, I'll turn uh, to uh, Dr. Liu Lin Hu uh, on um, the, yeah, there is another piece in that story which happened in 2019 under Abe and 2018. So in fall 2018, Abe made speeches at the UN, at the UN uh, General Assembly, and then he published an FT op-ed really you know, claiming leadership as he was taking leadership of the G20, uh, leadership on climate. And then he went to Davos early 2019 and he made extremely uh, you know, bold commitments. Uh, I remember debriefing this, it's still pre-pandemic, so I had a chance to debrief this in Meti and in, uh, in the Kante and also Gamusho. And they told me that there was almost surprising to the, at least to Meti, and it was not, integrated into an action plan, but still there is that track record, right? So that bold leadership started on the Abe without implementation. And then Suga then picked it up uh, and put legs into it. And then now Kishida is advancing it. But so what drove Abe then uh, to, to start that story, even though the implementation or the, or the strategy was not in place yet? Uh, do, do you have a sense of what was happening. And if public opinion is so soft, unlike the Rinko Izumi, who was very responsive to it, um, why, why was Abe and then Suga and then Kishida doing this? Uh, is it a big strategic vision? Is it pushed you know, by Gaetsu? Or is it uh, due to other second tier political entrepreneurs like, uh, like Kono and Koizumi behind, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I have no uh, insight into what Mr. Uh, Abe's uh, intentions were in relation to that kind of language. I mean, to me, you know, the, the, the NDC is where the rubber hits the road because Japan's essentially entered into an international commitment of sorts to, um, you know, that it's mm -hmm. now seeking to meet. And a really, really key um, issue uh, uh, that emerged was the, um, the, the uh, decision of uh, Prime Minister Suga to step down and the entrance of uh, Prime Minister uh, Kishida into the uh, prime ministerial role. The reason why that mattered a lot is because at the time that Prime Minister Suga committed to stand down, the uh, basic energy strategy, which incorporates these very ambitious uh, targets for decarbonizing the power sector, had not yet been ratified by the cabinet. And uh, if you remember, one of the uh, candidates for prime ministership at the time actually said that they would review those 
uh, and uh, with, a, with a mind to weakening them. Um, uh, now, Mr. Kishida uh, was successful and uh, then the, uh, those, um, you know, those 20, 30 targets for the power sector uh, built into the basic energy strategy were ratified. Uh, and that means they've essentially become part of, you know, domestic policy and METI is now on the hook uh, to try and, uh, you know, uh, bring those about. That's going to drive energy policy making for the next for the next three uh, next three years till we see uh, you know a new um, a, a new basic energy strategy put together. So I think that Mr. Kishida, um, you know, kind of his hands were tied a little bit. Uh, it would have been really tough to redo those things once they were put together. So I think that there is an important story to be written about what drove uh, Prime Minister Suga to make the um, speech that he made in the opening of Parliament um, in his first uh, speech. I have some you know, uh, uninformed conjectural opinions about that, but, um, but they're not based on hard data. So maybe someone here wants to, wants to write the article. <laughs> so uh, now I'm going to turn to uh, Dr. Masako Konishi-san uh, to, to actually, if you want to pick up where uh, Liu Lin left, uh, if you have any insight on the political drama, clearly there is a whole political sequence going on from Abe to Suga, and especially on the Suga, but uh, with Kishida. And what do you see are the big political drivers and behind, right, that are influencing decisions and, and the pathway? Um, I think Mr. Dr. Oda righteously pointed out that I'm pretty sure it's a Gaia to international pressure and especially that is coming from investors pressure. Um, mm -hmm. WWF is doing this science-based init target initiative, SBTI for the companies who wants to claim that they are doing good for the environment, that they need to set their reduction target in line with the science coming from the Paris Agreement. And I see a very interesting trend when Japanese companies want to join this science-based targets, the companies who are under uh, international pressure moved first. And still the very domestic companies such as utility is not moving forward. Meaning that if the Japanese companies are exposed to investors requests that started like since the adoption of the Paris Agreement, that they're gonna divest their money if you don't take action in line with the Paris Agreement. And that changed a lot of the Japanese companies, I believe. And then it now the TCFD and also the carbon adjustment border mechanism that EU is going to implement these are becoming a big international pressure, pressure to the Japanese companies that the government needed to change. If the government doesn't take a robust position such as carbon neutrality by 2050 or a raise its 2030 target, at least in the same level as EU, then Japan, Japanese companies will be really, really in a you know, position that is being pressured by investors that Japanese companies are not doing good and Japanese government is not doing good. There is a strict guideline for that. So I think that is one of the big move why Japanese government changed its position so drastically. And I think drastic change is a very, high risk for Japanese companies. So I do believe that Japanese companies need to think beyond the government decision right now. Fascinating. Actually, I had a quick uh, follow up for you since you have been at all those COP. I, I remember something that was really amazing was at the COP, uh, at Copenhagen, right? COP 15, 2009, uh, on paper just before the COP, uh, you know, the Hatoyama government and the EU had pretty similar targets, similar demands, etc. But when I debriefed people on the ground, they said there was no cooperation between EU and Japan, no at least coordination. Uh, you know, Japan came on its own, etc. So do you, 
as you see the COP over, over time, have you seen this EU-Japan cooperation playing a role at any COP? Uh, and how is it today, right? Is, is there, uh, you know, because on paper, they're kind of going in similar direction, but how do you see that EU-Japan linkage in COPs and beyond? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a very valid question. And um, I have to say that I'm not an expert in international politics. So I'm talking about only from my personal experience at COPs, mm -hmm. but I do believe that um, there was not much cooperation between EU and Japan since the Copenhagen towards the Paris Agreement. More, I think EU is trying to get a coalition with the more vulnerable countries so that they could become a big number pushing at the UN level negotiation to put more robust uh, agreement. And from that point of coalition, Japan was not a part of it. So Japan was more like excluded from the group that wanted to push more environmentally robust framework. So from that point of view, um, I think, of course, in a trade level or business level, EU and Japan is a very good partner, but from the pushing the robust international framework negotiation level, I think Japan was excluded and not only from EU coalition, but all level, because there was a saying that Japan is now, it, it, people are passing Japan. So that, that was what I got as my personal experience. Well, it's amazing. So now I'm turning to Dr. Hiroshi Ota. I would love to hear your view on the changing politics behind all this and the battle between ministry has MOE gotten any uh, allies over time? How is this balance of power moving? And uh, you know, the role of political entrepreneurs, has there been any reliable political actor, leader over the last 15 years that has made a difference, nudging the coalition uh, toward MOE and NGOs? Um, how do you see the, the politics? Yeah, and most influential entrepreneurs. <laughs> Uh, but going back to the other administration, I think uh, other administration started uh, decarbonizing in the 2050s. There's lots of uh, policy papers uh, under the other administration. So just sugar pick up the obvious, you know, the initial uh, you know, studies. So I think uh, maybe others received uh, other administration before received tremendous international pressure, particularly EU, about uh, ambitious setting, ambitious target. So I think uh, those kind of amounting and then kind of initiating domestic policy change gradually. And the other maybe, maybe uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, took a, you know, a cosmetic leadership role, I guess. But that's very similar to the Hatoyamas. You mentioned about the Hatoyamas and 25 reduction target. But actually, this is kind of bold, ambitious target, but for the very, very, uh, uh, pragmatic implementation stage of the energy policies, all the same. It's always make these uh, kind of a reign the power and then deciding the energy policy. This thing with energy policy is very crucial to determine Japanese climate change policies, always relying on nuclear and fossil fuel and then renewable was kind of a, you know, a marginalized. So even though the Hatoyama looks very much uh, you know, uh, becoming a leadership role, taking a leadership role, but in substantive uh, you know, matter is always energy policy is kind of a, a drag down the, uh, this kind of leadership role. So I think uh, I don't know any inside information about how the Japanese delegations in, in uh, you know, uh, negotiating with EU counterpart. I think uh, according to the, uh, 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 the uh, some, uh, uh, the uh, previous uh, coincidence, you know, uh, the remark, I think uh, Japan is not in, within the same table to seriously discuss the uh, you know, international uh, target, I guess. And for the uh, power relation between METI and, and uh, MOE, I think uh, uh, this is just my outsider observations. METI is gradually becoming a defensive position compared with the Kyoto uh, negotiation era and post-Kyoto. But definitely after 
uh, cabinet decided to this new uh, energy policies and also 2050 carbon uh, neutralities, and that was in a, a book, in a, in a legal statement, suddenly they had to uh, uh, respect that decisions. So uh, try to now uh, come up some kind of a, a, the uh, workable uh, policies. But uh, I think uh, since this 46% reductions was really made from top down without any bottom up uh, calculation on how to achieve this one, I think uh, Meti has faced tremendous difficulties. But I, I will say that uh, also Akonis-san also uh, rightly pointed out uh, Japanese business sectors pretty much pushing even within k lens they're thinking about uh, really seriously about to decarbonize fish. But I think 230 target, 46% is quite you know, uh, unrealistic, I guess. But the 2050 target, maybe, you know, if uh, technological uh, development catch up with this uh, trend. But I, I don't know about the two, 2030s. But suddenly I see some kind of power balance shifting toward MOE. And then I hope that the uh, advocacy questions, particularly uh, MOE, environment NGO, and eco-business sectors should be uh, getting uh, stronger, having a tremendous international support. This is my, <laughs> my uh, kind of a uh, hunch. Oh, thank you. This is fascinating. Uh, would anyone here in the panel add anything to this discussion before I turn uh, to Fuma for the next questions? Mm -hmm. Um, I would yeah. just say on 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 Medi versus uh, you know the MOE um, you know two things. So you know, I mean authority authority is drawn from the legal frameworks under which they operate. So you know for the MOE um, you know to my mind the MOE is playing a, quite an important role under the the um, you know the framework law that it has in place um, to help uh, manage climate change if you like. So. That has enabled the MOE to, um, you know, provide advice essentially to subnational governments uh, who are looking to develop uh, low carbon or decarbonisation plans. Um, and so, you know, it creates actually a very different dynamic, which is a dynamic which enables local government uh, initiatives within, uh, you know, decarbonisation planning within Japan. So, quite a number of um, cities. Uh, regions in Japan have now got uh, zero uh, net zero targets, for example, which is something that we didn't really see before. I think that's a really terrific, uh, you know, dynamic um, and a very interesting dynamic. If you look at Medi, um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, the agency Natural Resources Energy sits within them. They've got all the expertise, um, you know, and the capabilities to deal with issues, for example, of decarbonizing the energy system. If we're looking, for example, at redesigning their transmission grid to uh, and the rules around grid access and use to enable more deployment of renewables, there's only one organization that can do that within Japan, um, and that is METI with the support of OCTO. So, um, you know, METI has got an incredibly important role. And I know that we often talk about METI as, as being backwards leaning on decarbonization, but there has been a lot of really, really important work around transmission planning which has been done, which is going to be absolutely crucial to decarbonizing Japan's electricity sector. So I think they really do need recognition for the, for the fantastic um, you know, technical work that's been done around grid planning. Very interesting, yeah, thank you, that was great. All right, if there's no further point, I'm turning now to you, Fuma, for you can bring the next round of question and also the audience questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, speaking of climate and environmental uh, governance uh, on the 11th anniversary of the Fukushima nuclear disaster, uh, last year the Japanese cabinet approved the dumping of radioactive water from the Fukushima nuclear plant into the Pacific over a course of 30 years. This was met with concerns from countries bordering the Pacific Ocean, such as China and Korea. Is there any alternative for Japan to discharge its nuclear waste? And what responsibility does it have towards the international community to do it in a more sustainable manner? Anyone could address this question.
it might be a bit of a complicated question to address and unpack in a few minutes, but um, yeah. I mean, I can uh, say one or two things. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Otafan. I, I sort of feel like this is an issue that, uh, you know, um, Japan, you know, I'm an Australian, so maybe I'm, you know, someone from um, Japan is best place to answer this. Well, I think it's a very difficult question. I think there's no uh, right answers to your questions. And certainly, uh, I think we should avoid, you know, anything, all, no nuclear, I mean, it, uh, wastewater into the sea. And certainly, I share the concerns among, among the others with, with uh, emitting this kind of uh, you know, discharging these uh, 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 polluted waters. But as far as I know, uh, of all the uh, stakeholders, including uh, fisheries and the local communities, strongly opposing this idea to so discharging this uh, polluted water, even though the uh, scientists say this is the uh, uh, safe, you know, into the uh, uh, safe in terms of the uh, health hazards and also in environmental concerns. Uh, but the uh, According to what the uh, governments and also the uh, supply company saying that there's uh, no enough room left to storing these uh, waters into this same sites. And, and then also the uh, containers uh, having certain the problem of uh, uh, maintenance and also the uh, material itself has to be considered about uh, the uh, er erosions and but I have no <laughs> uh, clear answer, you know, the alternative way to, to discharging this polluted waters. So if IAEA, uh, you know, uh, certify the safeties, I think uh, uh, the, the, the uh, general public maybe gradually approve the discharging uh, polluted water into the sea despite the strong opposition from the uh, local peoples and then foreign countries concerned. I'm sorry, I have no, <laughs> no uh, expert, expertise idea about this one, but that's quite a very fair uh, uh, discourse questions to raise, I guess. Did any, anybody help me? <laughs> that's much more helpful. Well, I think from an international kind of perspective, the key issue is transparency, right? So. You know, I mean, you know, you you want to ensure that, um, you know, data uh, around, um, you know, the relative concentrations of radioactive substances in the water, which is being used to cool the, the, uh, you know, the um, uh, the, the damaged units, um, you know, is is transparent um, and credible, um, and you know. Uh, to, to me that, that that's crucial and so um, you know one one would look to international um, you know organizations such as the IAEA to to ensure that that that's the case right um, and, and and so I think that that's the most important issue right because then you can make a judgment about whether there's what what it what if any risk there is which uh, exists um, you know through the dispersion of that water Thank you so much. Um, is there anything else the other panelists would like to add to this topic or conversation at hand? All right, well, if not, um, I would like to move on to the Q&A portion of this event. And um, the first question comes from Nagasaki Shinya-san. Um, and this is addressed to Dr. Oda. Uh, to what extent are the effects of the declining birth rate aging population and declining population taken into consideration when discussing GHG reduction in Japan. Also, some experts have been pointing out that manufacturing in Japan, Monozukuri Nihon, is a story of the past and a major change in the industrial structure is required. How is that taken into consideration? Thank you very much, uh, Nagasaki-san. It's quite deep with question. But the first part of the question, I think uh, I'm sure that the government will uh, uh, kind of uh, 
relevant uh, section is incorporating the decline of the population into aggregate data to calculate the total emission of Jap Japanese uh, you know, uh, CO2 emissions. So I think I'm sure that they are doing that. And, but second question is, yes, yeah, certainly uh, for the most advanced semiconductors or IoT era, uh, IoT field, Japan is quite behind. So Japan cannot uh, uh, produce the most uh, advanced semiconductors. So th this clearly shows that Japan is losing the ability to produce the uh, most uh, advanced technological uh, material. But for the automobile, it's only the last maybe strength, stronghold of Japanese uh, industry is uh, automobiles. And some other uh, area is maybe AI and also robotics. So because of the population decline, Japanese in the industry or companies are serious about uh, developing robotics to uh, compensate the lack of the workforce. And so I think uh, certainly certain areas, Japan is trying to catch up with and also try to uh, exceed other countries. But the uh, most important area is semiconductors. And the most advanced area is quite uh, lag behind others. So in a sense, Japan is losing the uh, you know, lead in the, this manufacturing. But still, I think the uh, vast majority of Japanese company is a small and medium-sized company, corporation. They have the uh, skills and also artificial, traditional uh, kind of uh, uh, artisanal uh, the, uh, uh, skills may be still uh, important to applicable for the uh, more advanced uh, stage of the industries. So I think uh, the strength of the Japanese future manufacturing is whether or not the uh, Japanese government can you know, uh, uh, maintain strong, uh, small and medium-sized companies and enough you know, uh, manufacturing foundation or not. But certainly most uh, uh, cutting edge area, I think Japan is losing leadership. This is my uh, questions. All right, thank you so much. Um, would the other panelists like to add on to anything with what Dr. Um, Hiroshi Oda um, has said? Can I add to what um, Ota-sensei said? Um, it's true um, that Japanese um, manufacturing power is losing competitiveness. And actually, I, I, I personally feel that the automobile manufacturing, Toyota, is the last resort uh, in terms of Japanese um, industry. And uh, uh, that has been one of the reasons why the Japanese um, government are not being able to fully um, make transition into electrification of automobiles um, because Japanese manufacturing and car manufacturing companies have so much competitiveness um, in terms of hybrid cars, not electric cars. And so, uh, so, so that's what we have now in terms of industry sector is um, uh, becoming one of the reasons why Japanese, um, Japan is not being able to decarbonize our economy. Thank you so much. Uh, is there anything else anyone would like to add? If not, we will move on to the uh, next question. Uh, which comes from uh, Nagasaki-san again. Um, he says that in science, uh, tritium concentration is below the legal upper limit, which is understood internationally. South Korea releases more tritium into seawater every year than it releases from Fukushima, but uh, he has never heard of any problems um, with that issue at hand. Um, however, this is science and technology and it is natural that communication with fishermen and others is important. So I guess the question is addressing why is one topic at hand more um, discussed globally um, while the other is not perhaps highlighted in um, the news coverage or media. Thank you, Nagasaki-san. Um, I from I reckon we should take that as a comment rather than a question. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, yes, that's a very complicated, nuanced question that I believe we can't answer it in 
10 minutes. Um, but I guess um, we do have one more question from Nagasaki-san again, um, which is addressed to um, Dr. Oda again. Um, the, he says the Batelli bill in France um, set a time of 15 years for research. And as you can see from the reaction of Ise Jingu 20 years ago, um, is considered to be the upper limit of technology transfer. At present, it can be said that nuclear power in Japan is just uh, before extinction. After 2030, we will have no choice but to purchase nuclear power plant from China, Russia, or India. Uh, to what extent is such a reality uh, considered in the energy plan? In other words, can we think that Japan has already abandoned nuclear power uh, generation? I think uh, uh, certainly uh, the uh, nuclear uh, science and also students want to study about nuclear science is going to decline. But that, uh, I, I believe that uh, we can still have the promote uh, studying uh, nuclear uh, technology, mainly because we have to decommission quite many nuclear power plants and also to how to deal with the uh, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plants and how to decommission these most difficult areas and no, but no uh, kind of society experience this. So if the government is serious and we should uh, encourage the young scientists to study about the nuclear technology again and how to cope with this most uh, daunting uh, uh, tasks. So once they have a uh, systematical way to address these issues and try to uh, develop these technologies, Japan can become a leaders in these areas. Because quite may, we have many nuclear power plants in the world, and China is building, and, and India is also. So uh, in the future, this is kind of permanent uh, the tasks to how safely decommission nuclear power plants. So I think uh, Japan has to play this role in leading this uh, technological field uh, in order to be uh, provide special services safely decommissioning. Uh, the power plants. So I think we have lots of obligation too, as uh, one of the a country who experiences tremendous, uh, one of the worst nuclear accidents. So I think, I hope that the government can uh, direct this way. And then also people acknowledge the necessity of uh, nuclear science and technologies to further develop, to cope with this difficult problem. Thank you. This is. Thank you very much. Uh, would any of the other panelists like to add on to it's, what? Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of things maybe to add on nuclear. So um, first, uh, you know, uh, the Abe administration, the Suga administration, and I believe now the Kishida administration have essentially committed um, to, uh, you know, to, to restarts to the extent that they're acceptable by the public, but to no um, construction of new nuclear plants. So. There are, um, you know, a, a bunch of, um, you know, time series uh, kind of scenarios out there that show that, you know, if you was in, in, in the law, uh, which, which creates the nuclear regulatory agency in Japan, um, there is a, a 40 plus 20 operating life um, that's legally allowed under for nuclear units, that is 40 years. Um, that can be extended for 20 years, if the safety agency says that it's safe to do so. So if you say that, and you say, um, you know, that we're not going to build any more, then what you're saying is the nuclear industry is going to disappear from Japan over time because you're not going to be replacing any of the existing nuclear units, which are going to reach the end of their operating lives. Now, um, one thing that we haven't covered today, but, uh, you know, Japan has a pretty big, uh, you know, um, uh, innovation policy, green innovation policy. There are 14 different uh, components in that, right? Offshore wind's a big one. Um, you know, vehicles, uh, you know, other areas, energy efficiency, of course. Um, one of those is nuclear. And within that nuclear R&D program, is a lot of small modularized nuclear, um, you know, research related programs. So I think like lots of parts of the nuclear industry, you know, those um, small modular um, nuclear uh, reactors uh, is an area that, uh, you know, we don't know what the market will that like that will look like, but unlike the kind of big centralized units, which, you know, which we've been talking about up until now, there's another angle or area to think about, which is small modularized nuclear, um, which is being supported through 
um, you know, R&D funds in, you know, on an ongoing basis. Um, and, you know, it's at an early technology readiness level. So we haven't seen that commercially deployed yet. But, uh, you know, that's one possibility moving forward, right? Um, so that, I think that's something to watch, um, you know, where that sits. Thank you so much. Uh, I certainly believe that nuclear energy uh, policy is a discussion we must really have in Japan. And um, I think that's something that would um, come up in the future. That would be a very hotly debated topic, certainly. Um, we're almost um, closing in on our time for our event today. But before we end it for today, um, is there, um, would the panelists like to say a final remark before we go? Yeah, and if I may add you in your remarks, you could maybe address this one question is particularly interesting from Mark Elder. Uh, why does many and power company uh, what do they like coal so much when it's creating jobs in Australia instead of investing massively into high tech, you know, renewables in Japan, right? So why why this love for coal? Right? <laughs> Any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. I know literally already an answered to some extent, but uh, yeah, anyone wants to add on this? Because this is sort of the heart of this half and half Japanese plan, right? Mm -hmm. May I? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I also find this one really, really difficult to understand the attitude why the Japanese government and some of the Japanese companies really wants to still maintain the coal power plants. And I do believe that one big reason is that they want to maintain the status quo. So they have already invested a lot to build the power plants. And usually it takes 10 to 20 years to get it back. And then after that, running the lifetime 40 years, it's a very lucrative one. So um, coal phase out, meaning that they have to abandon a thing that may not uh, collected their investment yet, or to give up a very lucrative power plant. And they want to maintain as long as they can. I think this trying to uh, be status quo, maintain the status quo power is still very large in Japan because Japan um, really delayed its change and lost its 10 to 20 years already in the past, meaning that they still have a lot of old traditional power in place. So that is becoming a big barrier in Japan. So I do believe that in order to change this attitude, we need a really strong policy intervention. Fascinating. Yes, yes certainly, uh, Christian is right to say that uh, Japanese Societies, uh, particular industry has locked in carbon. <laughs> you know, carbon locked in is quite uh, serious. And then, you know, we have behind 20 or 30 years behind from the EU. So, you know, Germany, for example, started in 1990 seriously about renewables, but we have not just started. So I think uh, this 20 years of the loss is quite uh, uh, significant, I guess. So I, I believe that uh, I just said in the final remarks. My, in my presentation, so the advocacy coalitions, you know, like MOE, environment NGOs, eco industries, or business, I think are very crucial to change the renewable lock in to in, you know, in order to overcome this uh, carbon lock in. So I hope that, uh, but uh, Kamiyama san <laughs> presented the young people is not necessarily supporting this uh, climate change or energy transition. So that is, I don't know how to change the people's mind, but uh, I think we have been suffering quite a lot of the natural disasters, flood and heavy, you know, it's, uh, not drought so much, but uh, so we are kind of accustomed to the uh, severe climate. So I think uh, climate change does not necessarily ring the bell of the people, I guess. So I think uh, we have somehow relate this natural disaster to climate change and then energy uh, you know transition I think uh, last kind of connection we need to develop further 
uh, raise the awareness of people. So I don't know how to say, but uh, education is one of them, but the uh, college student is too old, I guess. We have to start from the elementary school or maybe you know, the uh, kindergarten pupils to uh, kind of uh, uh, educate and then and kind of plant some kind of ideas of the environmentally friendly life. That is my also final remark. Thank you very much. Uh, as my final remark, I want to um, raise the point of importance of local governments. I think we didn't talk so much about the importance of local governments because in, in traditionally Japanese local governments just um, in, incorporated what the national government has decided. But in terms of climate change and decarbonization, it was a, another, a, other way around. It was a local government that set the uh, net zero emission um, target first. After and after it was a uh, uh, Suga uh, Prime Minister Suga uh, setting the national goal. So, um, so this kind of tug of war between local government and national governments can also be a, explained as a reason whether or not to support coal because um, coal power plants are going to be big size. Uh, mega power plants. But if you go for renewables, it will be the local government who will get the most benefits out of it. So um, if the, we get go for renewable energy, I think we'll be able to get more energy to the local governments. And also it will be um, a, a way to um, influence the, the younger generation, as Tabitha has asked uh, the, 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 as for the next second question, I think the younger generation has not been able to fully experience by themselves what the climate change problem is. They only get the information from textbooks. And I think the, 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 one of the solutions to get the young people get involved in this uh, issue is to localize that the, the problem. So thank you so much. And Liu Lin, I guess. Liu Lin. Thanks, it's very, yeah, very quickly. One. So um, firstly, um, you know, just really wanted to strongly um, agree with uh, what uh, Kamiyama-san said um, about local government activism and the potential for that um uh you know for driving um you know decarbonization forward um i think it's really a, a super interesting and important uh dynamic which has emerged over the last few years um in japan which can really be built upon i also really wanted to agree with what uh, professor author said um, about japan starting late so energy transition is extremely hard and it's hard because of the durability of assets you know, uh, you know, nuclear plants, 60 years, a coal plant, 40 plus years, you know, gas, you know, 40 plus years. And, 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 you know, like really every country, Germany and others included, you know, if you're the asset owner, you want to run the plant for the expected lifetime of it so that you can get your, the return of investment that you had assumed when you made that initial investment. And everyone's really struggling with that. Um, you know, I think that, uh, that, that, Actually, Japan has has been really, um, you know, been put in at such a tough spot. Today's March the 11th, um, where I am at least, um, and uh, you know, this is 10 years, um, you know, since the nuclear disaster. The Japanese government's decarb plans were really built around the nuclear sector, and that was destroyed, um, you know, in in a few moments as a as a, as a decarbonization plan. Turning it around to get a, you know, think about a hundred percent, you know, decarbonized energy system which has doesn't build nuclear into the center of it it's always going to be a time consuming exercise it's a really tough thing to do and so i think that the suga administration's you know commitment and the work that's being done now really represents the kind of rebirth if you like um, of a new uh, direction and pathway for decarbonization for the country and i think there's been some terrific work which has been done to try and bring that about it's too slow but everywhere is too slow so you're the most optimistic speaker here and it's wonderful to finish with you for an uplifting note uh i'm i, I was most struck the thing that surprised me the most in the seminar in our discussion is the position of young people in japan 
Uh, well, next week we're going to have a, a young activist from Japan who has been leading, uh, you know, some of the action, Anika-san, uh, including declaration that was deli delivered in Hamamatsu to the mayor in a formal ceremony. So she has been on the forefront. But you know, this is the exact opposite of what we hear here uh, in British Columbia. Uh, and something that has deeply affected everyone is, you know, the forest fires, because in the last three years, we get two weeks where we have the worst air AQI on the planet. We're worse than any of the most polluted cities on earth. And it's from the forest fires. And we know that in by 2030, it's going to be two months, two months a year, but we can't see even our nose, right? I mean, the, this is getting really extreme. And then we had a heat dome where we got suddenly five degrees higher than the previous record on earth. Uh, I mean, here, and a city burning 20 minutes. So we, we start to see totally drastic change. Uh, and then we had an atmospheric river and then we had an Arctic outflow, all of it in the same year. So it's astonishing, yeah, that the young, young people are not yet deeply uh, affected in Japan because around the world, there's warning signs like never before of a whole other level that what we saw. The forest fires in Australia, I mean, were huge, right? A year, two years ago. Um, well, with those uh, wonderful thoughts, I, I think uh, the audience and I would like to thank you, uh, four speakers, for fabulous remarks, really insightful. There's a lot here on the table that came out deep inside and enough to inspire many research theses for uh, students. And, um, and this, this is wonderful to spend this time with you. We have learned a lot. So I really want to thank you. I also want to thank the audience. I wish we could now go for dinner and uh, really discuss this further. But uh, we'll have to postpone this, and but pretty soon we'll do make this happen. Um, so, in such way, and thank you to Ursa. Uh, and we had Patricia here, the vice president, and thank you to Fuma for co-moderating. Um, and everyone, uh, I wish uh, you uh, peace in this difficult time, and uh, and of course inspiration in uh, doing better with the planet.